Take your Bible tonight for our scripture reading to Acts chapter 2, if you would, please. Acts chapter 2, please. We're going to read the first seven verses of Acts chapter 2, and we read them responsibly, as we normally do, being together on verse 1, and I'll read verse 2, and we'll alternate reading till we end together on verse number 7 of Acts chapter 2. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 1 of Acts chapter 2. Ready? And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language." And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here tonight. Lord, I'm praying that you will continue to make our hearts ready, that we'll be prepared to receive the word of God this evening. We want our hearts to be good ground, good soil, that the word of God will fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. And so, Lord... I pray that you'll bless the special now and that it'll put our heart in tune with your heart tonight, that we'll all have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to each of us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's a covenant sweet, it was written for me, it's a promise that I could be healed from all my sin and my shame, even heartache and pain, it was signed and confirmed on a hill, so I read my case at the cross for now I have someone to champion my cause I've been justified satisfied oh I have it all so I rest my case at the cross don't feel sorry for me When you see I'm in need, there's a judge who grants mercy and love. All my burdens he lifts, all my sin he forgives, every trial is won through the blood. So I rest my case at the cross. Now I have someone to champion my cause. I've been justified, satisfied, oh, I have it all. So I rest my case at the cross. Oh, I've been justified, satisfied, oh, I have it all. So I rest my case at the cross. Amen. That's good. Wow. It's a good song. Father, we bow before you in prayer now. Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful, wonderful time together so far this evening. Lord, I've enjoyed so much the music. The, really enjoyed the testimonies of the people of God here. Thank you, Lord, for the folks who you've assembled here at Bible Baptist Church. And Lord, we're grateful that <clears throat> your promise is that you'll build your church. And it's exciting to watch you do that. 
here in this place. And Lord, you've been the head of this church for 63 years. And Lord, you've guided us and you've led us and you've provided for us and you've protected us. And uh, Lord, you have done some miraculous things that we have seen. I know in the 13 years that, that I've been honored to, to be here. And Lord, I'm sure throughout the years prior to my coming, uh, this church has seen you do some amazing things. And Lord, we look forward to what you yet will do in us and through us in the years to come until we hear the trumpet sound and we rise to meet you in the air and see you face to face. Now Lord, tonight I pray you'll help me as I bring this message and help each of the people tonight to listen carefully. May each of us not miss what you have for each of us tonight. Help us to focus, help us to, to stay concentrated on the message and on your word that Satan would not come and cause our mind to wonder and we would miss what the Spirit would want to say to each of us tonight. Lord, we desire to be the kind of people that you want us to be. We desire to be the kind of church that is on fire for God. So help us as we look into your word together this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. The village atheist was not a bad man. He just didn't believe in God. Wasn't interested in church, and there was only one in his area. But it was a pretty cold and dead place to be. More of a social club, actually, than a church. No decisions were ever made, and no one was ever baptized at the church. But one day, the church building caught fire. And the whole town was running toward it to help extinguish the flames, including the village atheist. And someone hollered out, hey, this is something new for you. It's the first time we've ever seen you run into church. <laughs> and the village atheist replied, this is the first time I've ever seen the church on fire. I hope and my prayer would be that the people in Grove City and the southwest side of Columbus would never be able to say they've never seen a church on fire. I hope they can say that BBC, Bible Baptist Church, can be the church that's on fire. Most of us have had the experience, sadly, of being in a church that doesn't have much fire, doesn't have much enthusiasm, doesn't have much energy. We had the, uh, earlier this year in, in, in July, we were on vacation and we stopped at a church and, and attended the service on a Sunday morning, and it's, and it's a good church, and they're fine people. And, and, and I'm sure they're, they're a good job. But I tell you, the, the service was just dead. Uh, there was no life. There was no energy. There was the, the things that were said were right and they were good. You know what I mean, preacher? I mean, they were good, but nobody said it like they believed it. Uh, it was just, just, as, uh, uh, just as stale as could be. And it was sad. Uh, when you stand, you know, you, you, you know, when somebody stands to sing, when you just heard Brother Bob sing, you know, Brother Bob sings with all his heart. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't just go through the motions. Uh, he's singing and he means what he sings and delivers the message in the song. We've all seen people just go through the motions of serving. Just go through the motions when they're serving God. And, and whether it's in the, or working in the nursery or whether it's teaching a Sunday school class or uh, whether it's being an usher or a greeter. Listen, the Bible says whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Uh, you ought to say, every job I have is an important job because it's a job for God. And, I, and it deserves my best and it deserves to be done with enthusiasm. So many focus on what they used to be. And that usually means they aren't that anymore and they have no plans of returning to that in the future. Don't rest upon what you used to do or what you used to be. This church has had a, a good history and and like any, like any uh, uh, relationship or any, any institution or anything that's been around for 63 years, there's been mountaintops and there have been valleys. There's been highs and there's been lows. 
And I know the, the highs, Brother Jim spoke of the bus ministry and the, the time when uh, back, in the, back in the day, Brother John, and uh, the buses and Margaret and uh, four buses or six buses, whatever it was, and 200 and 250 kids coming in on those buses. And uh, it was, a, I'm sure, a pretty exciting place <laughs> when you put 250 bus kids in a, in a building, uh, anywhere, especially in those little rooms you had downstairs and uh, packed them in. And uh, that was; those are exciting times, and those are good times. But but listen, if all we ever do is focus on the past, we destroy the future. You have to you have to be looking ahead and say, anytime you think the best days are already past, they are. You won't see any more good days. You won't see better days. But the better days, I believe, are yet to come. Someone said, "Well, what we need is new converts, and that'll set the church on fire." No, the truth is you need to set the church on fire and God will give you the converts. Charles Spurgeon said, put new converts into most churches is like putting live chicks under a dead hen. You know, Genesis 22, if you remember, is where God told Abraham to go sacrifice Isaac. And you remember at the time when they're preparing and they're walking towards the mountain, Isaac doesn't yet comprehend that he's the sacrifice. Okay? Okay? Remember what he said? He said, Father, we have the wood and we have the fire. But he asked his dad, where's the sacrifice? And that's where Abraham prophetically speaks. And he says, God will provide himself a lamb for a sacrifice. And that not only was the lamb that God provided there caught in the thicket, but he provided his lamb as the son of God. But, but you understand, 4,000 years later, we look at a churches and we would say just a different ingredient we would say we have the wood and we have the sacrifice Jesus has died on the cross but where's the fire where's the fire to send the message out and to tell folks about Christ let's talk about Baptists <clears throat> according to statistics it takes 40 Baptists on average one year to win one person to Christ yeah, that, that, that shouldn't just be wow, that should be oh me. This should not, not be, you know, you, you think, and by the way, most of the time that's because of a lack of fire. A lack of energy, a lack of enthusiasm in our life. The truth is, if we froze the world's population so that no one was born and no one died, and we froze it right where it is tonight, and... Our churches kept winning souls at the same pace they're winning them now. It would take us 4,000 years to win the rest of the world to Christ. The problem is, you don't freeze the population. They're being born every single day and more are being born than are dying. And so we're not getting ahead, we're falling behind. Shame on us. Shame on us. So if we look for a church on fire, it's not, listen, it, it, you don't fake a fire. I know. You can go out and buy these fake fireplaces, you know, that, that have a fire in them. Those are, those are, uh, those are worthless, okay? Don't, don't do that. That's not, if you're going to have a fireplace, have a real one. Amen? Should I preach on fireplaces tonight? But uh, have a real fireplace. But, but the truth is, let's, let's not simulate a fire. Let's have the fire of God. If we look for our example, we don't, I don't look to anywhere, any church in this world. We look at the church in the book of Acts. That's, that's the model. These are the apostles. These are the ones that received the first hand instructions from Jesus Christ about the church. And so let's look at the book of Acts. And if you, if you will, turn with me to Acts chapter 4 is where we're going to look this evening. Acts chapter 4. This was a church that was on fire. In fact, it started at Pentecost when cloven tongues like as a fire came and settled upon them. Now, they didn't speak in some unknown language. They spoke in the language of people who were gathered there for Pentecost and every man heard the Gospel in his own language. That was the purpose of that. To, to take that away, uh, I love what Dr. Curtis Hudson used to say. He said, 
to, to focus on the tongues and, and take away the fact that people were saved is like someone giving you a million dollars in a paper sack and you dump out the million dollars and keep the paper sack. That would be about as smart as you worrying about the tongues instead of worrying about the Gospel being given and 3,000 people getting saved. That's what was important to God. He just used the languages to help that along. So a church on fire, notice the first thing I want you to notice. A church on fire here in the book of Acts is endued with power from on high. In Acts 4 in verse number 8, notice the Bible says then Peter, and Peter was the leader in the early church there, Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. But then you drop down, if you will, in chapter 4 to verse number 31. And the Bible says this, And when they prayed, that's the church, that, that's all of them together, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the Word of God with boldness. It's the power of God. When the Spirit of God came upon them at Pentecost, and they were endued with power from on high, they preached the Word of God. They were bold to speak the Word of God. And listen, this filling of the Holy Spirit, it's for the pastor, and it's for the missionary, and it's for the evangelist, and it's for the Christian leader, but it's for every single believer. The Bible says here they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. It's, it's good for the pastor, but it's good for the people in the pew as well. All were being endued from power from on high. You don't accept a substitute. Don't, don't depend on man-made excitement to get the job done. Don't depend on programs or promotions or publicity or rep, uh, you know, repetitious uh, choruses sung over and over again uh, just to stir people into some kind of an emotional high. I remember years ago, uh, and, and I was just a, a younger pastor then, and um, the, thank you, and um, we, <laughs> a fellow was uh, coming to church occasionally and missing and, and asking him what he was doing. He was going over to the, uh, a charismatic church on, on Sunday mornings, and he said, you know, I just, I just like that music. Man, it just gets, my, gets me moving. And it's like a pep rally. That's what he told me. It's like a pep rally. Well, sure, that's, that's appealing to your soul. What's your soul? Your mind, your will, your emotions. What I think, what I feel, what I want. See? But is church about what I think, what I feel, and what I want? No. It's supposed to be what God feels, what God wants. What God, it's to please Him. And so, we, we try to, but we try to make up for that. We try to substitute that. None of, nothing can substitute for the power of God in a church. Nothing can substitute of being endued with power from on high. Turn, if you will, and hold your finger. We'll come back to Acts 4. But look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, would you please? 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul is speaking to this church in Corinth. And they were very impressed with different preachers. They, in fact, they, were, had, they had divisions in the church over Paul and Apollos and Peter, and, and uh, dividing over the preachers. And so Paul had to tell them in, in chapter 2, and verse number 4, he says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He said, listen, don't you go by what a man says or how well he says it or what kind of accent he says it with. Go by whether it's endued with power from on high. Paul said, I'm not trying to use enticing words. I'm not trying to bring psychology into the message to get you to do what I want you to do. He said, I'm speaking with the power of God and there's no substitute for it. Paul said, I'm not going to depend upon my wisdom or flamboyant sermons or tear-jerking illustrations or funny stories. He says, I just want to preach Christ to you. Charles Finney, the great revivalist of the 1700s, told about a church in a town where the fire had totally gone out. No one had been saved. And even worse, nobody cared. 
Do you want to see people saved? Do you want to see people saved? Do you want to see people saved? It was a dead church. Nobody cared, he said, but one man. One man, and it wasn't the pastor. It was a man in the church who was a blacksmith. And he wasn't much of a talker. In fact, he stuttered a lot when he talked, and so he very rarely said anything. When he did talk, it was very painful for people to listen to. But he had a heart for God. And he wanted revival to come. And as Finney tells the story, he was so burdened for the fire to fall and for revival to come, one day he closed the doors of his shop and went home and prayed the rest of the day. The next day he went to the pastor and he said, Pastor, I've been praying for revival to come. For God to rekindle the flames around here. Can we schedule a meeting, some kind of a revival? The pastor grudgingly agreed, but he gave him a warning that no one will probably show up. But they announced a meeting and they held the meeting and to the pastor's surprise, the building was full. He stood up to preach as always, but he said he felt something very different. The power of God was so strong in that place, you could feel it. Dozens of people received Christ as their Savior. And the fire was reunited and reignited in that church. Why? It wasn't, wasn't a program. It wasn't activities. It wasn't organizations. It wasn't because they had a youth leader. It wasn't because they had a praise band. It wasn't because they had a PowerPoint presentation or screens, it was because somebody prayed. Somebody prayed for the power of God to fall. Notice verse 31 of Acts 4, when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were gathered together. Nothing is born and nothing happens of value without somebody travailing in prayer first. It's always that way. When God is working and decisions are made, you mark it down. Somebody's been praying. Somebody's paid the price and travailed in prayer. You know, I'm not saying that you necessarily have to always just be growing in numbers to be a church on fire. That's not necessarily the case. But you understand sometimes God has to grow you spiritually before He can grow you numerically getting the, the, the foundation solid that He can add folks into your fellowship. It's like the fella, it's like the fella who can't, can't budget his money and he's always broke and, and he doesn't take care of himself and his place looks like a pigsty and, and he can't keep a job and he says, well, I just want a wife. How come God won't give me a wife? You can't take care of yourself. Why would God give you someone else's life to ruin? Come on. So listen, God is saying he'll, he, 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 would, he wants to give you the, 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 the He's got to give you some spiritual growth before He gives you the numerical growth. One day on vacation, Dwight Moody was visiting a large but dead church in London. The pastor found out he was there and asked him to preach. He wanted to preach morning and evening and Moody really didn't want to because he was on vacation, but he agreed to. But he said as he was preaching in the morning service, the people were so unresponsive. It was all they could do to even get through the message. Then it occurred to him he'd have to endure the same thing Sunday night. When he was supposed to be on a vacation, and he dreaded it all afternoon. But behind the scenes, something else was going on. An elderly woman that morning went home to her invalid sister and told her about Moody being there that morning. Her eyes lit up. She said, I've been praying for D.L. Moody to come to London. Put lunch away, she said. We'll spend the rest of the afternoon in prayer and fasting. And they did. Moody said when he stood up that night before the people, he could tell something was different. The atmosphere was alive. There was electricity in the air. The power of God. He said you could feel it. 
He preached with unexplained liberty, gave the invitation, and, and he said, I want you to stand up if you'd like to receive Christ as your Savior. And he said, 500 people stood up. He said, I thought they misunderstood me, and I told them to all sit back down. <laughs> He's saying, I'm saying he repeated it again with some more detail and more, more clearly about receiving Christ and, and repenting of your sin. And you know what? 500 people stood up again. And it was the beginning of what was one of the greatest revivals England ever experienced. Why? Because of D.L. Moody? Uh uh. Because of two old ladies. One of them, an invalid. One of them, bedridden. Said, We don't need more organizations. We don't need more activities. We need the power of God on this place. And they paid the price in prayer. They paid the price in prayer. What happens in a church when, you're, when a church is endued with power from on high? Number one, souls will be saved. In the early, early days, if you read the first few chapters here in the book of Acts, you see that church quickly grew to, to 8,000 and 10,000. Historians tell us it may have went to as many as 60,000 people in just six months. Amazing what they saw. Church services, number two, will be inspiring. The music will be uplifting. You read, you read Ephesians chapter 5 when it says to be filled with the Spirit. The next verse says you'll be speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. One of the signs of a spiritual church, a Spirit-filled church, is the singing is Spirit-filled. Boy, nothing, nothing worse than a church that sings and it's dead. Man, I don't want to sing, you know, what do we sing tonight? Where's the song sheet? Save, save, you know. I found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. I love to tell how he lifted me. Do you really want to hear about that? No. See? But, but when it's energized by the Spirit of God, you're not just singing words. You're singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You're not singing for each other. You're not singing for Brother Reed. You're singing for God. And you're singing with melody in your heart to Him. That's when you're endued with power from on high. You sing. It comes from being filled with the Spirit. The third thing that happens is the missions program will be divinely directed by God. You read through the first uh, 16 chapters of Acts and you begin to see from chapter not only when they scattered abroad in chapter 8 and preached the word everywhere but chapter 13 when they sent out the first missionaries Paul and Barnabas from the church in Antioch the holies they were sent out by the Holy Ghost remember not just sent out by the church sent out by the Holy Ghost through the local church the Holy Ghost directs the missions and the outreach of the missions program. Number four, divine wisdom will accompany the church decisions. You get to Acts 15 and they had a, some decisions to be made about the Gentiles receiving the gospel. And, and, and they, they had to have God's wisdom on the matter. And you get God's wisdom when you're endued with power from on high. He gives you the wisdom to make the right decisions. What do you do? when you feel the fire going out? What do you do when you feel that it's getting low? You better find yourself a place to be alone with God. Find yourself alone. Close the door. Lock yourself in a room and stay there until God ignites a fire in your soul once again. And ask God to endue you with power from on high. I don't want to serve God in the energy of the flesh. I don't want to serve God based on what I can do. I want to serve God in His power. I want to serve God with His energy. I want the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to be endued with power from on high. I don't want to try to make something happen. I want God to have something happen in me and through me. And even if necessary, in spite of me. 
to do a great work for Him. So a church on fire is endued with God's power. Number two, verse number 24 of Acts 4. Verse number 24. Where am I? Here we go. And when they had heard that, the, the, the threats from the chief priests, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. And it goes on to, to record their prayer and then the results of that prayer in verse 31. But I want you to notice in verse 24, they were with one accord. And then after verse 31, verse 32, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Here they are, all in one accord, all of one heart and one soul. And what, what, what I'm saying is they're not only endued with power from on high, but they were all equal in their positions. No one thought they were better than anybody else. No one thought they were higher than anybody else. They all were equal in their position. They're all pulling the same direction. No preferential treatment. No, no, nobody's saying, don't you know how long I've been in this church? Nobody's saying, don't you know I'm Carol Hoskins? I've been here 39 years. Huh? And Carol doesn't say that. Just, so, just for the record. All right? But you understand, nobody, nobody, sometimes you go to churches and somebody, somebody talks to you and say, well, you know, I'm one of the deacons here. Oh, is that important to know? See? You're trying to, trying to get across to me that you're somebody important. Did you know, did you know the name deacon means an eater of the dust? That's hmm? what it is. You're a servant. It's not a title. It's a serving position. No looking at one another. When you begin to look at each other, you begin to criticize each other. You begin to talk about one another. Why? The Bible doesn't say as we run the race that's set before us, we're to be looking at each other. No, it doesn't say that. As we run the race that's set before us, we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We keep our eyes on Christ. We're not, we're not looking at each other for comparison. Well, hey, hey, uh, John, uh, Peter tried that one day when he looked at John and said, Jesus, what, what's he going to do? What are your plans for him? Remember what Jesus told, him, told Peter? What is that to you? Follow thou me. Peter, what are you looking at him for? You're supposed to be watching me. So when about the time you get to looking at someone else, say, well, man, how come I'm doing everything around here? How come she doesn't do anything? She's not helping out. What are they doing over there? They, they're never helping. They never stay late and help clean up. Huh? Well, wait a minute. Who are you looking at? You're looking at Jesus? You're not looking at Jesus when you say that because Jesus would say to you, what are you looking at them for? You should be looking at me. Because we're serving and you're cleaning up or you're setting up or you're doing what you're doing. You're doing it to please Jesus. Not anybody else. When you have a common goal and you're joined together in equality and unity. Now, there's three dangers church members fall into. Number one, the first danger is magnifying your importance. Magnifying your importance. Feeling you're so indispensable that you deserve special treatment. Special privilege. Special consideration. Special recognition. Well, you know, I was part of that group too and the pastor didn't mention me. Hmm? Brother Ranky, how long have you been pastoring? 20 years. I'm sure you've had the experience. People who have got, got sideways or upset one way or the other and decided to go find another church, thinking that the church will never survive if they're not there. They think for sure if I leave, that thing's going under. And you know what you find out? The church moves on. You know why? Because the church is bigger than any one person. The church is bigger than any one person. Don't magnify your importance. Jesus said, on that rock, 
I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And if you're not careful, listen, not magnifying your own importance is not just for church members, it's for the pastor as well. I'm, I don't, listen, if, if I get lifted up, and, and by the way, pride always goes before a fall. If, and if the pastor gets lifted up and he falls, guess what? God will raise up another man to take this pulpit. And the church will go on. It isn't dependent on Pastor Slaybaugh. This isn't Pastor Slaybaugh's church. It's God's church. It's Jesus Christ is the head. And, and don't magnify your importance so much that it, it, it all rises and falls on you. Pride has taken down more people than almost anything else, including preachers. So you magnify. That's one danger. Magnify your importance. But the other side is the other spectrum where you minimize your importance. And that gets to that brings you to an attitude of being unfaithful to God. Oh, it doesn't matter if I'm there. Doesn't matter if I'm in my place or not. Doesn't matter. Hey, it doesn't take many, as you notice, when you have a when you have a choir of eighteen, it doesn't take but a few to say, Well, I just won't make it tonight. For it to be a choir of ten or twelve dwindles pretty quick. And sometimes it's just, oh, I got this coming. Ah, we just won't make it tonight. But you understand, you get three, four, or five people saying that, and it affects the choir. Boy, it's quiet in here, isn't it? Boy, a hush comes over the auditorium. Hmm? Got a, you know, ladies, when you say, oh, I'm just not making it tonight. Oh, that's right, it's my turn in the nursery. Uh huh. And you go look at the nursery schedule and it looks like somebody cut themselves and bled all over it. All these red lines all through everybody and writing in other names. Hmm? Oh, it's important. It's important. The greatest ability is dependability. Be dependable. Listen, anybody can be faithful. And it's required, God said in stewards, that all of us are, to be faithful. He said, well, I don't think I can get up and sing like Bob. Well, aren't you glad you don't have to? Okay? You know, but you can, do, you can be faithful. Well, I don't think I can play the piano or play these instruments like these folks do. You don't have to. You can be faithful. You know what, preacher? I, I can't do them of those things. And boy, you wouldn't want me in the choir. Every place that, that place would empty out. But I tell you what I can do, preacher, is I'll be here. I'll be faithful. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I'll, you count on me. Water, you know, two plus two is four. Water runs downhill, sunrise east, sets in the west. Pope's Catholic. I'll be here. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Dependable. Faithful. Don't minimize your importance. There's a poem that goes, a Sunday school teacher, I don't know his name, a wonderful preacher who never found fame. So faithful, so earnest when I was a boy. He stuck to his task, though I tried to annoy. He never was missing in cold or in heat. A smile his face lighted the moment we'd meet. He taught by example as well as by word. This splendid old teacher who honored his Lord. He helped my young life more than he ever knew. Later years I remembered and tried to be true. I suppose he's gone now to join heaven's ranks. And may it be by God's good will to someday say thanks. Don't minimize your importance to the body of Christ, to the church. You heard some testimonies tonight, and, and, and sometimes the guys at the prison are, are surprised when they say, well, how big is your church? I say, you know, on a good Sunday morning, we may have 135, 140. I say, we have maybe 100 Sunday night. They say, you're kidding. No. Bob, is Bob here? Bob Reed, he's out playing checkers. Okay. <laughs> he's, he had the numbers of what's spent 
for the prison material. And I don't have those right now. I was going to ask them him. You know what it is? Little is much when God is in it. There's, there's no way to explain that prison ministry. Now four different prisons. One prison twice, two different sides. Four different prisons and the, the hundreds of dollars it takes. There's no way to to, to kind of there's no way to explain how, how you support seventy three missionaries. Little is much when God is in it. There's no there's no there's no big money here. Well, except Brother Wallace. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but there is none. Just faithful people who love God. So the dangers with being equal or magnifying your importance or minimize your importance. But the other one, and just quickly, is misplacing your importance. That's where you're trying to be something God didn't intend for you to be. You know, everybody is, is given a spiritual gift. When you're saved, and I'm not just talking about a natural ability that maybe you were born with, but a spiritual gift. And you see those listed in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4. You read those three places and put the list together, you get the list of spiritual gifts. And don't, don't read that list and think, well, I think God left me out. God didn't leave you out. Everybody has a spiritual gift that they're supposed to use in the church. It helps the body function the way it should function. And so, it's, it's, don't misplace your importance by trying to do something that God didn't gift you to do. It's not, it's not to, I, I wouldn't have to have, I could have Danny come up and say, Danny, come up and sing a few lines of this song for us. And Danny would do that. But you would discern right away that he probably doesn't have the gift of singing. Amen? Makes a joyful noise. And the people at the nursing home love him. They do. And they sing and they have a great time. I love what he told me this morning. This is just a side note. He said, I tell the people at the nursing home, uh, you're going to have to, there's one thing you can't take to heaven with you, right? Is that what you tell them? There's one thing you can't take to heaven with you. You're going to have to leave something behind when you go to heaven. And they all said, what's that? He said, your wheelchair. Can't take that to heaven with you. You won't need it there, amen? That's good. Sometimes people say, well, preacher, I, you know, I, I think I have the gift of teaching. You know how you know whether you have the gift of teaching? Do people want to listen to you? Through the years, I had people come and say, oh, pastor, I, you know, I think I have the gift to teach. And, and sometimes you, you give them a room, give them a class, and guess what? Six months later, they don't have anybody coming. Why? If nobody wants to listen to you, you don't have the gift to teach. Boy, that's quiet, isn't it? Maybe I'd have, you're extending the service is what you're doing. So I, <laughs> Use the gift that God's given to you. Don't say, oh, I wish I could do that. Oh, I wish I could do that. Oh, you spend all your time wishing you could do something else. You're not doing what God's given you to do. Do what God's given you to do. And be thankful. This is my place. Don't, don't you know, if you're an ear, don't wish you were an eye. And if you're a nose, don't wish you were a toe. Just, just be glad God placed you where He did and given you the gifts that He has. Endued with power from on high, equal in position, and lastly, you'll find that the church on fire is evangelistic in priority. Evangelistic in priority. When you read Acts chapter 4, verse number 4, the Bible says, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men was about 5,000. Now how many were saved at Pentecost? 3,000. Now this just counted the men. Didn't count the women. So, it's just men, and they're up to 8,000. And you go on and read, they, they, you see down in verse number 
12, it says, Neither is there salvation any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Again, in verse 31, when they were endued with power from on high and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, notice the last sentence, they spake the Word of God with boldness. And you find out they went everywhere, door to door, house to house, preaching the Gospel of Jesus Christ. They told everybody they met about Jesus. They were evangelistic. They were soul winning. They wanted to go and tell the gospel to everybody. That's what, that's what a church is supposed to be for. Vance Havner said, Evangelism is to Christianity what veins are to our bodies. You should be able to cut a true Christian anywhere and they'll bleed evangelism. They'll bleed getting the gospel to people. I don't, I don't think your church needs a sign that says we major on evangelism or we major on soul winning. Well, of course, that's what you're supposed to do. You're a church. That's what every church ought to be. That's like a doctor putting a sign out saying, well, I major in medicine. Or I major on trying to make you well. That's his business, isn't it? Someone said the best remedy for a sick church is to put it on a soul winning diet. And that's a good truth. R.G. Lee said, God never intended for the church to be a refrigerator in which to preserve perishable piety. He intended it to be an incubator in which to hatch our converts. The church is a hospital for sinners. Not a rest home for the saints. We're to be fishers of men. Souls have to be the priority. Why, why, why church? Souls. I want people to hear the Gospel. Why, why pay the money to have services live streamed so people can hear the Gospel? Souls. Why Sunday school? Souls. Why an RU ministry? Souls. Why the RU inside ministry? Souls. Why radio broadcasts? Souls. Why nursing home ministry? Souls. All the ministries that you have, the goal is we're trying to get the Gospel out to a lost and dying world. Every week, that the, the track rack, we had to come out on a Sunday night and every week the thing ought to look like it, 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 it has been ravaged, it's gone, it's empty. We fill it up every week. And everywhere you go, you're giving the Gospel to people. Witnessing everywhere you go and taking the opportunity to tell folks about Jesus. Why? Because everybody ought to know who Jesus is. And let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Listen, you've got to tell the Gospel. When they were endued with power from on high and they were with one accord, the Bible says they all spake the Word of God with boldness. Oh, I'm just not much of a talker. No, but the Holy Spirit is. When He fills you and He endues you with power, you talk. It's called, listen, you're not under your influence, you're under His influence. That's why the Bible likens it to being not drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. When someone has had too much to drink, they're under the control of the alcohol. I've never known people, and maybe you were that way before you got saved, that when you drank, how I many you knew people, they do, you were that way or you know somebody that way, when they drank, they became a totally different person. Anybody like that? Yeah, they're about to be quiet and meek and be, and yet when they get drunk, boy, they're loud and boisterous and outgoing and they, they don't even act the same. Hmm? I wonder what you'd be like if you were filled with the Holy Spirit. What kind of witness would you have? Oh, they won't listen to me. You'd be surprised who listens to you when the Holy Spirit's at work. The divine appointments God will put across your path. Remember, if the church is on fire, people will come to watch it burn. What's a church on fire? You're endued with power from on high. We're equal in our positions. 
and souls are a priority. Getting the gospel out is number one. Now the question is pretty simple. Are you on fire? If not, why don't you rekindle that tonight? Why don't you ask God to put that fire in you? Only God can bring that. Only God can give that. Let's see what, what God will do with a church that's on fire. It's been a great 63 years. It's been a great 13 years. But God's not done yet. We don't know. I, I tell you, I remember coming 13 years ago. In, all, in October, it'll be 13 years. And I, and I think, Brother Wallace, somebody asked, you know, what are your plans for growth and your plans for all that? I'd have never envisioned any of this. I'd have never said, well, I think we'll start an RU program. I didn't even know what that was. And I think we'll not only have that on Friday night, we'll take it into prisons and we'll eventually be in four different prisons in a week. Oh, and, and we'll, we'll have a radio broadcast that'll, that'll reach folks with the gospel. I had no idea. No idea what, what God would have in mind. Oh, and, you know, we'll, we'll live stream services. Before, before Parax ever came, they watched services. Others of you are here tonight because of the radio. They never envisioned any of that. So you say, what's happening in the next 10 years? I have no idea. I just want to wait and see what God has in mind. And I want to be in the front row seat. Ready to do whatever God wants me to do. But I know this, if each of us are on fire, for the church to be on fire, each of us has to burn. Everybody. Can't just be the pastor. Can't just be the deacons. Can't just be the Sunday school teachers. It's got to be every member. Asking God to not light a fire in me, Lord. Let's, let's, let's reach our area for Christ. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for this church in Jerusalem. Uh, once again, they've been a help to us and a, a challenge to us. Lord, as you signified your power coming upon them with tongues of fire. Lord, we would desire to be a church on fire for you. I'm sure if tonight there was a literal fire in this building, most of the home road and the neighbors across the street would all come out to watch the fire burn. And I pray, Lord, that you would ignite a spiritual fire in us this evening. That, Lord, the Grove City and the southwest side of Columbus would come to watch people burn for God. Set my soul to fire, Lord. Set my soul to fire. Do that in our midst tonight, Lord. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. How many folks here this evening? They say, Preacher, God has spoken to my heart tonight. I need my soul to be set afire again by God. I want to be a Christian on fire for God. And I'm going to ask God to ignite that flame in my heart tonight. Will you slip your hand up and say, Pray for me tonight, Pastor? Amen. Amen. Wonderful. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. The altar's open. The altar's filled. Just, just use the front seat. But come and bow the knee to God. If you can't bow on your knee, just sit on the front seat. But move. Respond to what God's told you to do. Let's ask God to make us be on fire for Him. If you're on fire, folks will come watch you burn. It was said of John the Baptist, he was a burning and a shining light. And boy, they sure came to hear John, didn't they? And he preached Jesus to them.
Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. I would ask you as the pastor of Bible Baptist Church that you'd set my soul afire. And that you would set afire the souls of the members of our church. Use us as only you can. Have your way now in this invitation. May each of us respond to what you're telling us to do in our heart. And I'll thank you for it.